Well, good morning. Good morning. It is good to uh, good to see you all again, and to be back, and to to kick off a uh, a new series. Um, uh, there is a lot of things that are that are happening in our world, in, in our nation. A lot of things happening in uh, our city, your family, your life, and in the midst of all of it, uh, there's good, there's bad, and there's ugly. But there is also God, and and the God who is in the midst of it all is the one whose majesty and power requires our undivided attention, and not just our undivided attention, but our undistracted attention. And it's not like those other things happening in your life or in our world are are not important. They are. It's not like they're not significant. They are. It's not like them. they're not either joyful or painful. They are. But what's most worthy of our attention is God. What's most deserving of our focus is, is God. And I was thinking about this the other day, um, yesterday, as a matter of fact, and I posted it on, on Facebook um, reflecting on how many people are looking for God's purpose for their life. I mean, that's like a big thing. People looking for God's purpose for their life, God's plan for their life. Because they want to make their life impactful. They want to make their life meaningful. They know they only have one life to live. And once it's over, it's over. And people are wanting to know what is God's purpose for my life. Uh, so much so that the, the book that's next under the Bible as the most popular book or most purchased book is The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And people are buying that book by the millions. 60 million to be exact. Purpose Driven Life. That meant 60 million did not already have. A purpose driven life. And I don't know how many of them got it after reading the book. There's a lot of helpful insights in there. A lot of good ideas that can help you start thinking about things differently. It's been helpful for a lot of people. But there's this search still for meaning and purpose. And the thing I posted about was the fact that as people try to pursue knowing God's purpose for their life, many of them do not ever discover it because they're overlooking the need to know God. Emphasis is God's purpose, which becomes clear when you get to know God. And people are emphasizing purpose and ignoring God. How do I make my life meaningful? How do I make my life impactful? What should I do with my gifts and talents? What's God's calling? The emphasis is not on calling. The emphasis is on God. When you try to pursue calling, when you try to pursue his purpose without pursuing knowledge of him, you can't help but miss it. And you can look in all kinds of books and look high and look low and completely neglect the one standing in front of you. There is a significant purpose that God has for us, but clarity about his purpose comes with clarity about him. Who is this God who calls us? Who is this God? What is he up to? What's really on his mind? What is he doing in the midst of our world right now? So as we kick off this new series called The Greatest, throughout this series we're going to talk about 
different aspects of things that are great. Things that are great. I want to begin by talking about the greatest invitation. The greatest invitation. Because if we're not clear about the greatest invitation, we're not going to be clear about God. We're not going to be clear about our purpose. The greatest invitation. Have you ever had that experience where people went to an event, went to a party, went to a wedding, went to whatever, and you found out afterwards and you wondered how come you were not invited? <laughs> uh, it, it, it can be disappointing to realize that Others were invited, but you were not invited. It can be, it can be a painful experience because uh, we're created to be social beings. And when we realize that some uh, amazing event happened or people had an amazing time without us, we experience a sense of rejection. Well, what's wrong with me? Hey, well, how come I wasn't as important as the other people who were included? How come I wasn't as valuable to those who put on the event? They invited these people, but they didn't invite me. That's why it's tough when you're planning a wedding and the, that, that, that couple, out of all the things they need to be concerned about, as they begin to pursue getting married and, and, and the wedding and what their life is going to be, one of the most uh, 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 challenging decisions they have to make is who are they going to leave off the list. Trying to have a reception that matches the budget. All these people want to come for free. You could invite everybody if you're charged. <laughs> but, you, but you don't want that, do you? You don't want that. You want to go for free, and then uh, you want them to pay. And, and when they got to make the decision about who... Are they going to invite to the reception? Who do they want to pay for food for? It's their event and they're paying for you to come. One of the toughest decisions is who in our family, who amongst our friends are we going to not invite? Because we know it's painful. What are they going to think about our relationship if they're not invited? Even in your inbox, your email inbox, sometimes people want to, want to try to get your attention to put in the subject heading, you're invited. You go, what am I invited to? Click. <laughs> because we want to be invited. Because to be invited means I see you. To, me inv to be invited means I value you. To be invited means I want you there with me. That's what the invitation is all about. So if you don't get an invitation, it seems like the opposite message is being, is being communicated. We wanted to have fun without you. <laughs> we invited them, but we didn't invite. We, we're surprised you found out. But, but now that you have found out, Man, we've been praying that God give us wisdom on how to respond. How can we maintain our relationship and our friendship with you now knowing I did not want you to be here so that I could have a good time? <laughs> oh, navigating these invitations can be tricky. It can be tricky. I remember when I was in the Air Force as a chaplain, I was, my first assignment, I was a lieutenant for a little while, then I got promoted to captain. And if you don't know the military rank, um, generals and colonels are a really, really big deal. I remember the first time I got invited to the colonel's office, the wing commander. Chaplain, the colonel wants to see you. Why? <laughs> Why? It's like going to the principal's office. I didn't ask for an invitation, so I didn't want an invitation. Why does he want to see me? Colonel invited me to come to just welcome me to the base and say he's glad for me to be here. But I felt honored to be invited by the wing commander who's overseeing 15,000 people, but he carves out a few moments of his day to meet with Chaplain Captain 
John Harris, the new guy. I was honored to be invited, honored to feel valued by him, a person who I thought would have his eyes on so many other more important things, felt it important to invite me. And then as I finished my first assignment there at Hill Air Force Base in Utah, prior to me leaving, I got uh, a notification from my supervisor, the general wants to see you. Why? <laughs> <laughs> So we had a two-star general on our base, and he invited me to his office. When he invited me to his office, he, he wanted me to sit down, and, and he just wanted to share how grateful he was for our ministry there before I left. He wanted to tell me personally, thank you for what you're doing to help our pilots and to help our security forces and to help our folks. Before we leave, I wanted to give you, it was called a commander's coin, and he shook my hand and gave me a coin. I felt honored to be invited by the general. And then there is this big event in Washington, D.C., where the who's who of the Air Force is there. And because of some things God blessed me to do in certain assignments and certain things, I was invited to go to Washington, D.C., rub shoulders with three and four star generals at their dinner. And I walked into this big ballroom, and I just looked like a kid in a candy store. With all these, all these stars on people's shoulders, and they're walking around. And I heard somebody say, welcome, chaplain. And I turned around, and it was the chief of staff of the Air Force, four-star General John Jumper. And so um, I tried my best to control uh, my, my bodily systems, and, <laughs> and I, kept, I kept a straight face. I said... Hey, 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 how are you doing, General? <laughs> he said, Chaplain, thanks so much for, for what you do. Let's take a picture. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so he took a picture, and I got a picture with General, General John Jumper. Because I felt valued and important, like these people are significant. And they see little old me. Then while I was serving in Bagram, Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan in 2010, President Obama was going to come to visit our base. We were not excited about that because that meant we were going to be attacked. If you're the enemy and you know the president's going to be there, that's a great time to start launching rockets. So he came and and I worked as a chaplain in the hospital. And I was told that President Obama was going to come and visit the hospital. And that they're going to, he's going to be handing out purple, purple hearts to patients who were there who were wounded in battle. And so they're going to clear the entire hospital just to minimize any potential threats. There are some staff workers there who were Afghanis who worked in the hospital, janitorial services. They put them all in one room with security guards in front of the room. But they wanted to have a few things that were kind of staged. So they want to have some people there who could, who could meet the president and things. And I got invited to meet the president, to be a part of that team that was there as he came through. As he came through, he's much taller than I expected. And he's, about, he's probably taller than me. I didn't, don't know if, yeah. Yeah, exactly, see? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, it's like it's Abraham Lincoln walking up here. I knew, I, like, I knew he was tall. I didn't know President Obama was tall. He came through, and I was like, man, this is amazing to be invited to meet the president. All of those were great invitations, and they communicated honor to me and value to me and significance to me. But the greatest invitation that I received, the greatest invitation that was the most impactful was the one I responded to when I was seven. When my dad was standing at the front of the sanctuary and asking if anyone wants to, to be in the family of God, that God was inviting us to come and to be with him. And I remember peeking down the aisle, I was sitting in the back, I was picking down an aisle, looking at my dad up at the front. I'm like, man, this is an extremely long aisle. 
uh, he's my dad, we're going home together, I probably should just talk to him then. <laughs> but I felt something on the inside give me courage to walk down that aisle, and that's exactly what I did. I had heard the gospel before. I'd heard that God was sending Jesus so we can be reckoned. I'd heard it before. But this particular moment, even at the age of seven, I responded to that invitation. And I didn't, I didn't know fully what it would all be about. I just knew that God offered me an invitation to be a part of his family. And to do it, it meant believing in Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And that's what I did. That's what I did. And when I gave my life to Jesus, when I became saved, when I became a child of God, that gave me the highest status I could ever have in life. When a person is a child of God, no one can ever be more than that. You can, you can never be more. You can be the CEO of a company, but that's a man-made company and a man-made position. Given to you by man, it can be taken away by man. You can be a king, you can be a president, you can be whatever. You can move up in your, in your job and all these different levels that someone promotes you to. But all of those things are man-made. Man can give them and man can take them away. But this invitation is not an invitation that comes to man from man. It is an invitation that comes to man from God. That's why it is the greatest invitation because of who the inviter is. And the thing about it is that he's not just God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's not just, just God who, who flung the stars across the night sky and caused the sun to begin to spin. He's not just God. He is a father. See, he's not just a creator inviting a creation. He is a father inviting his children to come back to him because of sin caused a distraction, a destruction, and a decay in the relationship of this father and his children, causing his children to leave. And this father has given an invitation for all who are now in this world, who are spiritual orphans, the invitation is to come back home. The invitation is to come back home. Not just to a God, but a God who is a father. That's why, that's why we become children, because he's a father. And so as we look at this entire world, all of the darkness that is in it, all of the chaos that is in it, all of the jockeying for power and position, the manipulation and the control, we're looking at orphans fighting on who can be the most powerful orphan. We're looking at orphans fighting on who can get the most stuff, who can control the most people. Because when you are a spiritual orphan, the things of this world look significant and valuable. And they look like the thing that you're really wanting the most and needing the most. That's through the lens of an orphan. And so the Father's invitation that comes to us through Jesus Christ is to let us know, guys, I created this world for you, but this world isn't all. There's more to this world than what's in this world. And there's something beyond this world. And the orphan mentality that tries to get all it can so it can feel important and feel valuable. To push others down so it can feel significant. To get all the money and all the power and all the fame so that it can feel worthy and, and, and important. That, that, that orphan mentality is what people do in darkness.
And so it multiplies sin. And the invitation comes from the Father through Jesus Christ who came into the world as the light of the world. And he came unto his own and his own received him not. This is the invitation to come out of this world even while you're still living in it. This is the invitation to become a new creature, to become a child of God while we are still yet here in our flesh and experiencing this human experience and this human reality. The invitation that the God the Father gives to us is one that causes us to be forgiven of our sins, to receive new life. And with that new life comes a whole new perspective where you no longer look at the things of this world as things that you want. The, the power of the temptation is gone because you've been filled with something different. You've been filled with a new life. Let me, let me get three people to come up here real quick. Emphasis on the real quick. It's safe. It's all right. Okay, there's one. Let me get, let me just, just come on stage. There's three people on stage. All right. Good, good. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Now, what we have right here is the is the father the son holy spirit i want y'all to kind of be in a circle i know there's three of y'all we'll call it a triangle just kind of yeah it's kind of yeah, yeah just like a triangle yeah but big enough for me to fit in there in a second yeah way before the earth was created there was them the Father, Son, Holy Spirit in heaven. All the angels in heaven and they've got the whole thing. And they said, let us make man in our image. And they created humanity. Adam and Eve. And there were, there were guidance given for relationship. And when they violated the relationship by disobeying God and sin comes into the world, it created a fracture in that relationship to where we could not dwell with them the way we were created to dwell with them. In this relationship, they are eternal. They've always existed. They've never had a beginning and they will never have an end. But when they created humanity, they created a being that did not exist before. And they did not create that being to ever have to die. But because of what Adam and Eve did, it brought sin and it brought death. And it brought a fracture into this relationship. But because they did not create us to live separated from them, they also created a way for us to get back into the community. This is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. All are three and all are one. And what they wanted for us was for us to be able to be a part of this with them and to experience this community. We don't ever become gods. We become united with God. Y'all saying <laughs> Amen. It seemed like the right thing to do. <laughs> and so the thing about it is that once we are getting into this new community here through Jesus Christ, the Father has sent the Son. And when we accept the Son, the Spirit comes in to help us live in this community while still here. Here is life, not being a millionaire, 
here. Here is life. Not owning everything and real estate. No, 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 no. That's not life. It could be a blessing. It's not life. Here is life. Here is power. Not being promoted on the job. Not being promoted in certain uh, political uh, positions. No, here is power. Here is truth. Here is love. Here is identity. And here is purpose. And when people truly experience here, then it doesn't matter what the world has to offer, it pales in comparison. It's not even a temptation anymore. It seems so weak, so insignificant, so temporary, so futile because of what we have here. It's so powerful here that when our lives are threatened to leave here and confess something else, thousands before us have said, go ahead and cut my head off, but I'm not leaving here. Because I'm here, all you can do is kill the body. But the body is just a shell because I'm here. Because I'm here. Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, because we have been reconciled to God, brought back, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. We plead on behalf of God, on behalf of Christ to the world, come back to God. Now that we are here, our purpose Since we're clueless, our purpose is to tell them that here is available. Our purpose is to tell them the answer is not the drugs. The answer is here. The answer is not the addictions. The answer is here. That's purpose. So when someone tells me they don't know their purpose, when a child of God tells me they don't know their purpose, I have to ask them, are you here? Do you know what it's like to be here? Because here is so enjoyable, you want others to experience here. If you're not enjoying here, you might not actually be Why are people so disappointed in the church and the Christians this and the Christians that and the Christians? Because you can get baptized and not be here. You can repeat the prayer and not be here. You can have all the t-shirts and not be here. So some of the criticism that we're receiving is people who are acting like they're with us and they're not with us. Because when you're here, something changes on the inside. Jesus made it clear, if you're here, you're going to love people. And the world will know that you're mine. The world will know that you're here if you have love for one another. This is a community that we are invited into. This is the invitation to invite us back into here. And once we're here, listen to me. The primary purpose on earth for those who are here is to extend to others the greatest invitation. We have been distracted. There are things in our hearts that we are pursuing that have nothing to do with God. There are things in our lives that we want to change. We want to address it. We want, because there are other things, the things that we want our lives to be that have absolutely nothing to do with the invitation, have absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom, have absolutely nothing to do with it. 
And our country is our country because it's happened this way in the face of a distracted church. A church that has tried to pursue worldly pursuits. Trying to compete with the world. We have to ask ourselves this question. If the things of the world are that attractive to us, have we even seen Jesus? How do you make eye contact with Jesus and then catch your gaze somewhere else? Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen at all. Because of who Jesus is. And so the world is calling us on it. Saying, if that Jesus was real, then why are you acting like this? So, let me lighten it up so y'all can feel better. The Father, Father, he loves the entire world. It is not his will for anyone to perish, for anyone to die. And those of us who have accepted his invitation to be a part of his family, to be his sons and to be his daughters, you cannot afford to be distracted from everything that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit did to bring you into here. I get it. Even in my own life, there are times where other things seem to be so much more important. I get it. That's why there's no, there's no condemnation. The Father's not condemning us. He wants to realign us. So that number one, we can enjoy what it's like to be here. It caused Jesus a brutal death on the cross for us to be here. And when we believe in who Jesus is, we become a child of God. This, this whole community that we're a part of, this invitation, it is a, the, it, it, it's an invitation to be a part of a community that now transforms us and we become part of the invitation ourselves. Our lives become the invitation. And it's an invitation that leads to more invitations. Not only does the invitation come from the Father to the world through Jesus Christ and through us, but even being a part of this community, the Father consistently and constantly invites us into more things here. Because there's so many more things for us to discover here about what it means to be here. So he shares with us insights. He shares with us revelations. He shares with us things and he calls us up higher. Come on up higher. Let me show you something. Let's go deeper. Let me show you something. Get to know me. You can know me all your life and still not really know me because there's so much to me. I'm an eternal me. An eternal me. I didn't provide this for you so you can do like double dutch. We don't, you know, in and out. In and we, don't, we, don't, we don't do that. Let's not do that. Old Testament, David says, the, the, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. That's Old Testament. When you are in Christ, you ain't got to run to God. You're already in him. That's why, that's why he made it that way. I don't have to run to God. I never have to run to God. I need to be aware of God. I have to run. I'm in here. I'm in here. And this is so amazing. I want other people to be in here. And if I get tempted to do other things, if I get tempted by my, my attention, there's all these other things. If I get tempted, that, that means that there's more I need to be, be learning about what, what it means to be in here. The devil can't take me out of there. Doesn't matter how much he tries, he can't take me out of there. Now, this is the invitation to be a child of God. Every other invitation will fade with the world. But this one is the only one that continues. That's why it's the greatest. Because it's coming from God to make you his child for all of eternity. That's the greatest invitation. So like the parable Jesus said, go out into the highways and hedges. Invite them to come. 
to the banquet. Don't just be satisfied that you got an invitation. They need to know that they're invited too. They need to know that they're invited too. Let's all stand. There may be someone here today who has not received the invitation. It's not my invitation to give. It's just my invitation to announce. I was just like you. Lost in sin, trying to live my own way. But if you're here today and you feel like God is moving on you, stirring on you to say, man, I want to be a part of his family. I want to accept the invitation that God has given to be a part of his family. I've never done that before. I just want you to raise your hand. I just want you to raise that if that's you. I want you to raise your hand if that's you. Raise your hand if that's you. Okay. Since we're all saved then. Since we're all saved. My question to you is, what else do you need to know about this invitation? What else do you need to experience about this invitation? What else do you need to learn? So you're more rooted and grounded, less distracted. So that you're strengthened. So that you have peace. There's, there's peace in here. Why don't we have peace? Or we so feel with anxiety. Something, something's off. Right? There's comfort in here. Why are we so afraid? Why are we so afraid about our country? Right? Fear is driving all that foolishness. The Democrats trying to do the Republican, man. Why are you surprised that sinners are sinning? Like, I don't get it. I mean, I don't get it. Maybe the church does need to be woke. <laughs> right? No, we're here for an invitation, y'all. We're, here for, we're not here for 401ks. We're here for an invitation. I hope I'm telling you. That's what's going to change the world. Who is the father to you? And how does he want you to communicate him to other people? There's more I could say, as you can tell, but we've got to go, as you can tell. But know this. The father loves you. And you are a child of God. And no one can be more than that. No one can be more than that. No one can be more than that. What else are you trying to pursue right now? Financial security, I get it. Emotional security, I get it. Maybe physical health, I get it. All kinds of things. But everything is going to pass away, including you. Everything is going to pass away. And what will remain is what you did with the invitation. What you did with the invitation. Did you accept it? And did you announce it? Did you accept it? And did you announce it? Did you accept it? And did you announce it? Because you're announcing it is evidence you accepted it. Nobody keeps that kind of joy to themselves when they really have it. Father, I thank you that in this moment we just acknowledge your goodness and your love. You were not satisfied with us being apart from you, separated from you, distracted from you, but you sent Jesus Christ to be the bridge so we can come back and find our home in you. Father, even as we're here, some of our relationships are in trouble. Some of our health is having serious challenges. Some of our finances seem to be inadequate. There are so many concerns about ourselves, our families, our jobs. There are so many things. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that your spirit would bring a peace to your people that they would find true rest in who you are. Thank you for extending to us the greatest invitation. Even though we don't feel worthy, you thought that we are. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the way back home. Thank you that we can come out of darkness into light. Help us to have the curiosity to explore the light 
be changed by the light, to grow in the light, to enjoy the light and to share the light. Forgive us for being distracted. Forgive us for putting selfish desires before you. Help us to stay focused on the things that are eternal, the things that will matter even when we're gone. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.